Introduce our next panel of speakers um, on a perspective on IRS virtual currency enforcement and action. Our moderator, Ms. Cameron Adderton, focuses her practice on helping clients resolve tax policy issues both legislatively and through the administrative guidance process. She brings an insider's understanding of tax policy issues, having previously worked in senior counsel roles at the U.S. Department of Treasury and on Capitol Hill. On our panel, we have Dr. David Shakow. He is a tax attorney who served as Deputy Tax Leg Legislative Counsel at the U.S. Treasury and was a professor at the University of Pennsylvania Law School for 18 years. He has published many articles on tax issues, including a review of the tax treatment of cloud computing. Next, we have Ms. Karina Federico, who is a civil litigator and tax attorney, focusing on tax controversy and tax litigation matters. She was a trial attorney at the U.S. Department of Justice Tax Division, where she represented the IRS as lead counsel in civil actions, contested matters, and adversary proceedings before the U.S. District and Bankruptcy Court. Last, we have Ms. Caroline Sirola. Sirola. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's okay. As a former acting assistant attorney general of the U.S. Department of Justice's Tax Division, her practice focuses on complex and sophisticated civil tax controversies, including representation-sensitive audits, administrative appeals, and litigation in federal and state courts and tax tribunals. Thank you all. Um, I'm really excited to have this panel here today and talk about some very uh, interesting and current issues in IRS um, enforcement and what we're seeing now in this space and what we may see in the future. Um, so before we start the panel, I'd like to just do a basic disclaimer, as um, I think you have all former government folks up here, so I'm very recently uh, former, that these opinions are our own, not representative of our current or former organizations. Um, and in particular, Caroline um, is so fresh from DOJ that her uh, name is actually on some of the papers for the Coinbase um, issue case. So we're going to be discussing that, but she will not be talking about that specifically um, and won't be expressing any opinions or details about that. So I'm going to leave it to Karina to talk about Coinbase first, and then um, Carolyn can provide a little con color and context of some other enforcement actions. Sure. So in talking about Coinbase, I first wanted to talk about summons enforcement generally and kind of what the Department of Justice and the IRS's role in those cases are. Um, so the IRS has the ability to examine books and records of taxpayers um, when they're conducting an audit. And one way they get these records is by issuing summonses to taxpayers and to other third parties, such as banks and financial institutions. Um, so normally, you have an you know, individual corporation under audit, um, and the IRS will issue them a summons of perhaps their bank or a financial institution. Um, However, in limited circumstances, the IRS has the ability to issue a summons to an unknown individual who's under investigation. Um, and these are known as John Doe summonses. And these are, have a little bit of a different procedure. So in the first case, um, you know, where the taxpayer is known, the IRS can just go ahead and send out the summons. Um, in these John Doe summons cases, they actually have to go, the IRS has to go into court, um, get a court order before they're allowed to actually send out the summonses. And the reason for this is because the court um, has the responsibility to ensure that the tax investigation has a legitimate purpose and that the records that the IRS is seeking are relevant to that purpose. Um, so to do that, they, um, the IRS, through the Department of Justice Tax Division, goes into court and they file a petition um, ex parte for court approval to file a summons. Um, and the IRS has to show a few things. They have to show that the summons relates to an investigation of a particular person or group. Um, there's a reasonable basis for believing that that group or individual is not complying with the internal revenue laws, um, and that they can't get that information through a readily available source. Um, and through this investigation, um, their, the IRS's powers are very broad. Um, the Supreme Court has actually compared their powers to that of a grand jury, uh, which can investigate merely on the suspicion that a law is being violated. 
Um, and so once the court grants approval for the IRS to issue the summons, the IRS issues the summons and the taxpayer um, or third party, in this case, um, would either comply with that or either fails to comply or refuses to comply. Um, if they comply with it, great, they, the IRS gets the records. If not, the Department of Justice can represent the IRS, go into court and bring what's called a summons enforcement proceeding. Um, so in that instance, the Department of Justice would have to show um, a few things. They would have to show um, that, or sorry, the Department of Justice would have to, to prove that they had a reasonable basis for, for bringing that summons, and then the taxpayer or the third party could contest it. Um, so there's basically two steps in a John Doe summons. First, getting the court approval to actually issue the summons, and then if the, um, the tax or the third party that's receiving the summons, if the person summoned um, doesn't comply with it, then there's a second proceeding to enforce it. So the Coinbase proceeding is the is of the first variety, um, where the IRS DOJ are going into court, getting permission to actually um, issue the summons to Coinbase um, for taxpayer information. So um, the, IRA, uh, the United States filed their petition for leave to serve this John Doe summons back in 2016. Um, and they stated in their motion that the taxpayers investigated have not been or may not be complying with U.S. internal revenue laws requiring reporting of taxable income from virtual currency transactions. <clears throat> and the group of people they're looking at are U.S. taxpayers um, who, during the years ending 20, uh, December 2013 through 2015, conducted transactions in convertible virtual currency as defined by the IRS. Um, the IRS has issued very limited guidance on this, but they issued one notice back in 2014. And basically, they've defined virtual currency as property. So when the IRS is saying um, that they're looking at people that have conducted transactions as defined by the IRS, they're basically um, referring to this notice. <coughs> and they're asking for a wide uh, range of documents. It's very broad. And these documents include the account registration records for when um, Coinbase customers sign up for an account. Um, know your customer due diligence performed on each account, and then also the associated transaction records, account statements, and records of payment um, made and processed for those users. <clears throat> um, so the DOJ is arguing that they need these documents to reveal the identity of the account holders as well as transactions. Um, and there have been a few interveners that filed actions to contest um, and move to quash the summons, and they're they're arguing that. Um, you know what are interveners? Oh sure. <laughs> um, interveners are so they're people that are not named parties in the case. So these are, in this case, they are Coinbase customers. Some of which one of which identified himself, and three of which um, are filing as John Doe interveners. Um, so they're basically saying that we have a an interest in this action, even though we're not a named party, and therefore the court should hear our arguments about whether or not the summons should be issued. Um, so there. So right now, um, the current state of this case is that there's these interveners that have said, no, um, the IRS should not be able to issue these summonses. And the court is, is receiving briefing from both sides um, and holding a hearing next week to decide whether or not the motions to intervene should be granted or whether um, the case should proceed forward and the IRS um, should be able to issue the summons. Um, <clears throat> there's also some other briefing that's scheduled, which will conclude at the end of August. So by the end of August, there should be a fully briefed case if the motions aren't decided next week. Um, there's also a, in the scheduling order, an, an opportunity for um, amicus briefs, which are like, they're called friend of the court briefs. Um, but these would be other interested parties that are not Coinbase users, but maybe you know, industry groups that want to file a brief um, in support of one side or the other, arguing their, their views. So it's kind of the state of where that case is right now. Um, Thank you. And I guess one of the big questions that we have is why should we care? I mean, this is one exchange, um, but is this a sign of things to come? And how do these enforcement actions proceed? Um, and what is sort of the bigger implication, the bigger picture of an IRS starting an enforcement action like this? And so I'd like to turn to Caroline to ask um, for a little bit of color on some other um, investigations and enforcement actions um, 
and if you could start by sort of just explaining kind of why these might be similar or why we should be looking to this the action that you're going to describe. Thank you. So first of all, thanks for having us. We're really happy to be here to talk about this. And if you have questions, please don't hesitate to interrupt us. We're here to provide information for you to help in whatever industry you're working in. So, um, you know, any time a government is seeking information about its citizens, particularly in a new area or a new um, economic platform, there's going to be some pushback. We've seen it at, at various times over the years, and in particular, we've seen it in the offshore arena. Um, there are lawsuits challenging FACTA, which is your Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, um, and the Bank Secrecy Act requirements of filing foreign bank reports each year. Um, so there's always a pushback whenever the government is seeking information. And there's plenty of case law out there that says the, the IRS and the government can't do certain things just to conduct research, right? They can't issue what or seek um, a petition, a file a petition to seek information just to do research. Um, there was a case from the Supreme Court on that. So in this situation with um, Coinbase and with digital uh, currency, I'm not surprised that there's a pushback on this. This is an industry where people don't necessarily gravitate towards it just because they're looking to evade taxes or to commit crimes. They may have a distrust of the government. They may not have access to traditional financial institutions. They may seek the ease of the transfer of funds that virtual currency provides. There's any number of reasons why people engage in virtual currency, as you know probably better than I do. Um, but there is a group of individuals and entities that are using virtual currency to engage in legal violations. Um, we saw this in the Silk Road case. We've seen it in other cases where they use it as a tool to commit tax evasion, to evade reporting requirements. And it's very similar to what we saw over the last 10 years in the offshore tax enforcement arena. So back in 2008, um, the government's investigation of UBS, the Swiss financial institution, became public. Um, one of its bankers pled guilty to aiding and assisting U.S. taxpayers in evading their tax and their reporting obligations. Um, shortly thereafter, in February of 2009, UBS entered into a deferred prosecution agreement with the United States. Um, that was a game changer. As part of that deal, UBS turned over the identities of um, a significant number of U.S. Clients. These are clients that for decades had housed their money overseas and thought that their information was private, that they would never have their data turned over to the United States. They had numbered accounts. They often held the accounts in nominee industry um, accounts or under foreign structures. And all of a sudden, their information was flowing to the United States and in particular to the Internal Revenue Service. From there, the IRS announced the offshore, the first of the offshore voluntary disclosure programs. That was in March of 2009. We are in the fourth iteration of these programs at this point. Um, almost 100,000 U.S. taxpayers have come in under these programs, or what are called the streamlined filing procedures. And under these procedures, people come in and they admit that they've had accounts that were not reported to the U.S. government. They admit that they owe tax because of the income generated on these accounts or these assets. They file amended returns. They pay any appropriate penalties, or they argue that they shouldn't pay penalties uh, because they were not willful under what we call streamlined procedures, and they come into compliance. The IRS is looking at the su success of their offshore programs and understanding that this was an environment where people believed that their, um, their identities were concealed. It was perceived anonymity. It was perceived difficulty in tracing funds. And after the last, I guess, 10 years, the IRS has proven that, no, we can find out they, they can find out the identities, and they can trace the funds. I think we're seeing the early stages of that in virtual currency. Now, it may be more difficult. I am not a blockchain expert. I suspect we have blockchain experts in the room. Um, but as people know, you can, if you have enough time and resources, trace the identity. You can determine who owns various digital addresses. And it may require a lot of time and resources, but it's possible to do. And as the government gets better at understanding this environment and understanding these platforms, they will pursue these cases. The petition that was filed late last year 
um, like I said, I can't talk about it in detail. I was leading the tax division when, when the petition was filed. But I think that's the beginning, not the end of the conversation with the government. This started with FinCEN, uh, the Financial uh, Crimes Enforcement Network. They were really at the forefront of identifying virtual currency as an issue and trying to establish rules and guidelines for money services businesses. Um, that led to the GAO report in 2014, or 13, it was 13. Um, and then the IRS notice that came out in 2014, trying to take this new platform and apply traditional rules of taxation under the Internal Revenue Code. So um, we've seen a lot of success uh, by the government in the offshore arena. There have been civil audits, there have been pursuits of uh, individuals that are not filing their foreign bank account reports, there has been litigation, including online gambling accounts in the Ninth Circuit, um, where the district court found that all three online gambling accounts had to be reported on, on foreign bank account reports. The Ninth Circuit reversed on two of those accounts, but held that one of the accounts, um, and I it was uh, FirePay, because it was a money transmitter, was in fact subject to reporting and that the taxpayer was subject to civil penalties for failure to report that account. So this is an emerging area. It's definitely an area that we should be watching, but our, yeah, in watching it, we can be informed by the actions taken by the IRS, the other John Doe summonses that they were um, successful in getting the courts to authorize um, an issue to third party record holders. It's important to remember that just because someone doesn't, that someone receives the John Doe summons doesn't mean that there's an allegation of misconduct. This is the one thing I can say, and then I want to toss it to David in questions. Um, there have been no allegations of misconduct by Coinbase. And I think that's really important to remember as we talk about that case. This is an information gathering process because of a true reasonable belief by the government that these, <coughs> some of these taxpayers may have engaged in violations of the Internal Revenue Law. It's not a criminal investigation, it's not an allegation against Coinbase, and it's not on the verge of someone filing an indictment against one of these taxpayers. Now they may be under a separate investigation, but not simply because of the John Doe's. Great. Thanks very much. And you just um, said a few minutes ago that this is an example of a case where the IRS is taking new technology and applying the traditional rules mm -hmm. to it. So I'd like to turn it to David now to talk a little bit about just how, give us some other perspective on how tax law um, takes time to adapt to new technologies. So in thinking about how uh, the, uh, the cryptocurrency uh, uh, activities might be might uh, be brought within the realm of the regular tax law, you can look to prior situations where the uh, tax laws had to deal with new technology. So, at least some of you may remember that when uh, you first had personal computers and you wanted to get uh, software, you'd get a, a buy a floppy disk. Uh, now, local uh, sales tax rules will distinguish between uh, tangible property, actual physical things that you buy, uh, which are normally subject to tax, and intangible property, uh, uh, in, in, uh, where uh, some, at least some states, will not tax something if it's not physical to it can be, uh, actually touch. So uh, it, the the initial uh, view of tax of local tax authorities towards these floppy disks was that basically you were buying the computer program. Computer program was not something physical, and therefore they did not subject them to tax. Uh, that lasted for a while uh, until the extent of, uh, of uh, this software activity became so great that uh, uh, local authorities reconsidered. After all, um, you know when you buy a, a, a Rembrandt painting, the paint on the canvas is not uh, all of it. It's uh, uh, it's just a small part of it, and yet you view it as physical. So, in the same way, even though most of the value was coming from the computer program itself, the authorities moved to saying, "Well, we have something physical there; we have a basis for taxing it." Uh, when it's come to cloud computing, uh, authorities are still kind of working on it. If you uh, store uh, store information in the cloud, uh, some uh, uh, local authorities want to say, "Well," uh, they are actually renting some space for you on their computer, and that falls under a, a rental 
uh, rule, which may be different from if they're providing you with a service, which may be taxed differently. And where that occurs is a question that is not so easy to resolve. And I think the state and local governments uh, and uh, internationally, people are still struggling with this. Uh, when you get to the blockchain technology, uh, you, you can distinguish between those potential technologies uh, which are uh, which attempt to be totally anonymous, like uh, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, and things like that, as opposed to uh, other types of applications of, uh, of uh, blockchain technology where there will be someone who knows what's going on. If you talk about applying blockchain, let's say, to uh, the previous panel we discussed, uh, value-added tax, where whenever a transaction occurs, you're going to collect the tax. Well, uh, the uh, uh, governments will have to know whom they're getting tax from and whom they're not getting tax from. And so uh, it will not be a totally anonymous kind of structure if, it, uh, if it's developed uh, compared to a Bitcoin type of structure. Uh, but when you, when you talk about uh, cryptocurrencies, what's, uh, what's uh, allowed it to go forward in the Coinbase situation is that uh, you have exchanges where they actually know the people who are engaged in the exchanges. Or they have, they, uh, at least they may have some idea of who the people are engaged in the exchanges. And since the government has jurisdiction that it can go into, it can, it can serve a summons on the exchange. Uh, it's able to get that information. Of course, if the uh, <laughs> if the summons is successful, uh, it will it may encourage other exchanges not to locate in the United States or not to locate in any jurisdiction where they fear uh, that uh, someone will ask them for information. And that will be a, at least a first level way of avoiding the problem that uh, if you view it as a problem that Coinbase now faces. So uh, the question is, what can be developed? to deal with this kind of anonymity. Uh, so what's, what's worth appreciating is that um, uh, methods uh, do exist uh, where, where it's not so obvious as to how you're going to deal with a problem. Uh, the mention of, of FACA, this attempt by the United States to gather information from foreign, uh, let's say, foreign banks as to who might be their depositors, uh, initially, it seems uh, problematic because the United States has no way directly of uh, forcing a foreign bank, which is not located in the United States, to provide it with information. Uh, the solution that was used there was simply to say, uh, if you don't comply with our request for information, uh, uh, any uh, investment made through your bank uh, is going to be subject to a 30% uh, a, a tax automatically. Uh, and since the United States is a, a, a big enough player in the whole international financial market, it became very unattractive for foreign banks and other financial institutions to not comply with the United States' uh, desire to get information. Uh, <clears throat> that still doesn't tell you how you're going to deal with, uh, uh, with Bitcoin uh, and other cryptocurrencies. Uh, so an, another kind of closer analogy, which governments are struggling with, are um, uh, internet advertising. How do you collect money on internet advertising when it's all done uh, when it's all done electronically? Uh, some governments, Italy, for example, has uh, decreed that if you, at least if you are an Italian advertiser and you want to advertise on the internet, you have to do it through an Italian. Uh, middle entity, so that which will give the Italian government the ability to tax that kind of uh, that kind of uh, activity. Now, can you do something like that with Bitcoin? Well, you can tell everybody if you use Bitcoin, you have to report it to us. Um, uh, whether you know that doesn't seem like it's too successful a an approach. It seems like a lot of people will will simply ignore that. Um, uh, this. Uh, Analogously, uh, many states had so-called use taxes, uh, which are kind of sales taxes if you don't buy it in that state, uh, which were on the books and never enforced until states realized they needed to collect more money. So they simply told everybody, we assume, a lot of states have done this, they say, we assume that you're buying things over the internet and not 
paying taxes to us in, in that case. Uh, and if that's uh, and so we will just assume that you have to pay a certain amount of tax unless you can uh, assert to us under penalties of perjury that you're not doing so. Uh, you keep a record of any out-of-state purchases you make. Uh, whether that's a direction that could be followed here is, I think, still uh, up in the air. It's, it's things seem too uh, too anonymous to immediately get there. But uh, as we gain a better understanding of how the technology works, there may be a possibility for the tax authorities to get hold of it in uh, further along than the the coin-based type of litigation. Great, thank you very much. Well, I think we're a little short on time, so I'm going to open it up to questions now. Yes, go ahead. So, so, so basically this kind of next generation economy that can be, that, that blockchains can be a substrate for, are going to revolve around tokenizing of assets. So bar you know, barrels of oil, wheat, loyalty points, securities are all going to be kind of these tokenized assets. And, um, and obviously you guys aren't the federal government, but what do you think about the fact that if you fungibly exchange these assets, they're going to be subject to kind of short-term capital gains tax? Uh, I mean, buying a cup of coffee based on the IRS ruling right now would subject anybody exchanging for short-term capital gains. This, I mean, this was the situation uh, and, until uh, legislation dealt with it when you had foreign currency. Foreign currency is, is in the same position uh, and uh, absent what now exists legislatively, which says that we will disregard uh, your normal traveler, you have to have a certain level of activity before uh, you're subject to tax, it's, it's simply disregarded. Australia does that with, uh, with cryptocurrencies. And it simply says that consumers are, are not going to be bothered, e even though it's true that each that technically each time you use a uh, a Bitcoin to buy anything, you are engaged in a taxable transaction. So that's that's one uh, that is is solvable. And as I say, there's there's already examples of it being done. The IRS can't do that because uh, it needs legislation to do that. In other words, the IRS as an administrative agency can't simply say, well, we're going to call it currency, even though uh, it's clear that any normal definition or, or a legislative uh, interpretation of what was done in the past uh, clearly did not reflect uh, cryptocurrencies, because I think most people still have a difficult time getting their minds around the fact that you can use money that isn't issued by any you know, governmental entity at all. It's done. In the terms of the short-term capital gain, the IRS Notice 2014-21 does address that. They have a specific Q&A on the characterization of the gain from exchanging virtual currency. Um, and, it, and they're falling back on traditional tax principles. Um, looking, there's a Q&A on how do I calculate my basis. There's a Q&A on is this reportable and what's the character of it. So um, it can... I, as complex as it gets, I think the IRS is trying to bring it down to its basics and saying, if you have an appreciation of wealth, Section 61, like the traditional, everything's income unless it's not. Um, if you have an appreciation of wealth, it's taxable. And so let's start from that premise and go from there. One, one can guess that there are a lot of people using Bitcoin who are not, who have not read that notice. When I took tax in law school, my professor insisted that every year on his tax return, he had a line for the uh, pennies that he found on the street because technically it's income. But I, I think even many of his students did not comply with that. And, and then just a quick, quick follow-up. I think, you know, with, with the Coinbase example, uh, you've got a gross majority that are not trying to quote-unquote evade their taxes. Uh, and I think the majority are benevolent actors. Uh, in typical securities, uh, the broker-dealer is issuing a 1099. So, so right. whether you're a credited investor or not, you don't have to really deal with it. That's right. Um, and in these cases, those entities aren't. Coinbase is in, and, and the other ones that are similar. Um, the burden then goes to the owner of, of the account, which I think is like overly cumbersome for the retail investor. And 
is, is there thought on potentially, and, and again, you guys obviously aren't the IRS, um, having like 1099s in these exchanges? I, I mean, I, I, I feel like that would solve your critical mass because you're regulating the on-ramps and the off-ramps. But do the exchanges know what you pay for the for the currency that you're exchanging? In other words, in other words, the broker dealer, if if they're regularly managing your account, they know what you paid for it and they know what you're selling it for. But if you just come in and say, I want to exchange these Bitcoin for for dollars, uh, there's no 1099. At least the, what we normally think of as a 1099, which reflects uh, and something that would be considered income is not going to be reflected on the fact that you made the exchange. It could be a loss. It could be a gain. Uh, you could ask the exchanges to simply report the fact you did it. It's not going to help the taxpayer to know what they can put on their return unless they've, they've kept records. Yeah, I think that's similar to like selling stocks before the stockbrokers had to, like they, had, they didn't have to give you the basis. Or, yeah, the, the and now it's moving market to market, right? Yeah, so you had to calculate yourself. Like if you sold stock, you'd have to go back. And, and it was easy if it was like a publicly traded stock. You could say, you know, back in 1990 when I bought it, it was worth this, and today it's worth this. Here's the difference. Um, but there's some more complicated transactions that aren't publicly traded where it's kind of the same issue where you, you have to keep track. You, the user, has to keep track of it yourself. Yeah, that um, still happens today with stock. Exactly. So if, I, if I somebody um, you know, died and the estate gave me some stock, right? you don't you know, know what they paid for. Yeah. Or somebody gifted it to me, gifted it For the historical. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, because now it must be reported. Today, right? yeah. I mean, I think so. we're going to see advancement in this area, just like we saw advancement with the securities. Unfortunately, we're in an environment where there's not a whole lot of regulations coming out, right? Particularly with the executive order that was issued um, earlier this year, you know, the two for one. Um, and so, um, while everyone agrees, FinCEN, IRS, you know, everyone agrees there should be more guidance in this area. I don't think you're going to see um, a reduction or a pullback in enforcement to the extent that either the IRS or the department thinks that people are engaging in willful violations of the internal revenue laws. So there's a difference between lack of guidance and therefore a mistake on a return, which could be a civil tax issue, currently acting in good faith, ambiguous guidance, no penalties, let's fix it, versus those that are willfully using this as a tool to evade. And I think you're right. I think, it, you know, that was at one program where they talked about 800 people filing reports with respect to the Bitcoin transaction, and there's a million Coinbase users, so it's obviously there's discrepancy there. But many, many Bitcoin owners own one Bitcoin because they wanted to try it out. So not everyone would qualify for the reporting. Um, Coinbase is an exchange, though, and it's already gathering a lot of data as a money services business. So it's not like this is, you know, a, a, a clean field and they're saying now we have to start from scratch. They're already gathering a lot of data under the Bank Secrecy Act requirements. Quick question. I'm a Canadian tax lawyer and might be helpful Welcome. to my <laughs> uh, people on this table. I've been following the issue with Coinbase. So, for example, you both, all of you guys know about the letter dated June 2nd of this year from the Congress yeah. of the United States, which makes reference to the September 21st, 2016 Treasury Inspector General for Taxation. It seems, as I understand that part of the narrative, is that what they're concerned with the IRS is that they're going forward with this John Doe summons. And, it, first of all, they're not at the, the Congress... It's not even sure if they have a legal basis, as I understand this letter. But let's assume that they do. But it seems that my reading of all the documents seems to suggest because the lack of clear guidance from the 2014 notice, they want the IRS to come with a comprehensive strategy to deal with this industry. So with the hopes in the near future to address the question you made and not try to pigeonhole into the traditional tax codes, unless I'm reading all along. But I think that's why they wanted an answer to the IRS. The IRS is supposed to provide an answer June 7th to the Congress to address their concerns. Right. I think many people are coming at this thinking that these are mutually exclusive. They are right. not mutually right. exclusive approaches. You can seek, or the IRS can seek through the Department of Justice, right. 
A, the authority to issue a John Doe summons to gather data based on a reasonable belief that there are violations of internal revenue laws, and still, on the other side of the House, with Treasury, right. work on guidance. And there's certainly guidance that was issued in 2014. I'm aware of the letter, yeah. and that certainly um, speaks of... Um, constituent involvement um, because it's clear that it, it's arising out of this litigation and, and Congress and certainly the Oversight Committee has the right to, to seek that information and, and to ask the IRS to provide it. But um, that will not prevent them from um, pursuing the John Doe summons. And I think anyone who's representing um, owners or exchangers or administrators or wallet providers of virtual currency should not be thinking because there's a congressional inquiry um, that this is going to subside. In fact, I think it's only going to ramp up. What we're seeing is activity from all branches of government and a lot of interest here, and so it will accelerate. And so knowing that the information that's going to be gathered could result in civil enforcement, right. criminal investigations, it's important to make clients aware of that. And I know Canada is investing a billion dollars in their tax evasion, trying to reduce the tax gap. So I suspect we're going to see a lot in Canada as well. Well, this is the first time ever in Canada there's actually a commission, well, a group coming together to calculate the tax gap. Yes. In terms of dealing offshore, they've just allocated $456 million. That's right. Which all tax practitioners agree that's an incredibly small amount of money to deal with these issues. I could go on at nauseum. Yes. Like you yes, talk, no, I'm familiar with the landscape. Yeah. So, anyway, I just want to understand the part of the narrative from both sides. That's all. Yeah, a letter from two members of Congress does not mean that Congress as a whole is necessarily that concerned about it. And the other aspect of it is that the IRS ultimately can only do something with what the current law is. It actually, if something innovative is to be done, it's the IRS should be writing Congress saying, why don't you do something about it, because they can. And there are actually uh, two letters. There is one um, from the heads of the Bakshi Caucus, and then there's also another letter from the heads of the Tax Rating Committee. Okay. And so that's that, the letter from the Tax Rating Committee does suggest that the um, you know, folks with jurisdiction over IRS and over this issue is... Um, that are paying attention to this now. Okay. So that's a pretty interesting development. Um, we have, I think, time for one more question. Sure. Corporate tax question. Yes. So companies issuing ICOs and token sales are advised to not call them securities. <laughs> Do you foresee a revolution <laughs> where these become taxed by corporate taxes, sales of tokens, versus uh, being communicated as securities and say this is a product that the platform is offering? Customers are buying it, we're going to sell it. What, what, does, what does the token represent? Uh, unit of value for, think of it as, uh, someone else can probably explain this better than I can. Depends. I mean, it could be something intrinsic. So, so the Howey test is kind of the, the, the large precedence on if it's a security or not. And I think depending upon what these assets represent, because they could be barrels of oil, or they could be cloud storage, or they could be, you know, fuel to for transactions, or, or they could be just some speculative instrument that should be labeled as a security. So, I mean, it really depends. It's a, it's a digital representation of an underlying asset. <laughs> it's a digital representation of an underlying asset. That, that's basically what it is. Well, I mean, you know, traditionally, I mean, the, the only... Thing that they can, uh, a corporation can sell tax free is an interest in itself, um, but when uh, uh, you know when General Motors issued these uh, E class shares, I don't know, it's actually quite an innovative idea where they took a part of their company and said you're going to have an interest in that. So and and that was accepted as being as being equivalent to selling stock even though it wasn't stock in the whole company uh, that being the case it would seem conceivable that you could say well we're selling you an interest in this pool of assets not a separate subsidiary but in this pool of assets uh, that's 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 going a step further and the, the person who got the e stock uh, convinced the, the e stock uh, was stock was uh, Justice Ginsburg's late husband, who's uh, uh, it's hard to find someone like that around now to do the same thing here. So I don't know the token. I don't, I'm not sure where the tokens can be 
included within that normal rule of, of securities, but if that would be the direction you have to go. Thank you. Well, I think we have run out of time. Um, so I think in some ways this panel was the flip side of the regulatory panel we um, heard this morning, and that um, you know we in the tax world tend to think that clear rules and um, rules that are easy to understand and follow are very helpful for um, practitioners and for taxpayers. And um, so I think that this has been a very helpful perspective on what happens if you don't have those clear rules, and even if you do, what the um, you know, enforcement implications are for these new technologies. So um, thank you very much to our panelists, and thank you all for coming.